Welcome back to Naval Action and this is episode 4 of A Letter to the King which is my attempt to keep people abreast of what is happening on Euro PvP 1. Um, this is the fourth episode and let's see where we were at the start of the week. So if you recall the Brits had pushed the Danes pretty much out of the whole South American join here, leaving them with only one shallow water port from memory. So clearly they were going to get smashed, that was obvious. The Spanish have pushed into the Yucatan and the expectation is that they're going to push down against the Brits here. Um, the Americans have begun to push the pirates back and if you recall the British and the Americans made an agreement at the end of the previous week that they would help prosecute the pirate rash that was spreading across the centre of the map. Um, the uh, Dutch, the Swiss and the uh, French, that's right, had all agreed on a common currency to use in New Little Europe that they were setting up over here. Um, Swedes, sorry. Um, so that's where we were last week. We had a Britport had been snuck into the bottom of Haiti and the pirates had grabbed the islands around Cayman Brac. So let's see how the week unfolded. So as you can imagine with such a massive British force around here the Danes would be gone in a jiffy. Not to be at all. The Danes um, defended really well their shallow water port. Um, reports that I heard I wasn't involved in the battle down there was that they had an excellent shallow water fleet. Um, they held off an attack and then uh, during the, the, the early hours of the, the weekdays really um, the Danes smashed the Brits taking 20 ports over three nights pushing the Brits all the way back to uh, Gracias Adios taking the islands um, and now really I was just waiting for the Spanish to come tearing down here and the Brits would have been in right trouble in this neck of the woods. You can see now that the Danes held pretty much the whole of this peninsula all the way up to uh, uh, where's that Honduras. Uh, towards the end of the week, the Brits did manage to recapture a couple of ports and hold the line. So I think they took two or three ports in here and they recovered these islands. But nonetheless, uh, a huge week for the Danes. Now, I have to point out, and I've, I've had a few people make this criticism, I'm not involved in every port battle. I'm not involved in strategic command anywhere. So I do get my reports second and third hand, and obviously sometimes they're a little bit misguided. There was rumours at the start of the week that the Danes were sailing around here with a dread fleet of 15 first rates, and that by the end of the week it would be 25 first rates. I think they had certainly a lot of first rates, maybe eight or nine. Uh, other than the early defences, which I think were furiously fought port battles, I do think that this was a lot of empty capping that took place um, till the end of the week where there was a fair bit of biffo. There was a couple of port timers not set around Grindstone. They were easy caps. Uh, and these islands were taken back. So we'll have to see what happens in this area. This will be really interesting. If the Danes do have such a big fleet down there uh, with so many first rates, what is interesting now is with the patch that came out midweek and the inability, I suppose, to just go out and cap AI third rates left, right and centre, the exhaustion aspect of a large campaign that is defended or, or is, is attacking defended ports might be interesting. It, it might become harder and a little bit more difficult to maintain a steamroller or of course you could exhaust your opponent and maybe it just snowballs. So we're going to have to see how that pans out now the patch has happened. Um, in the past your PvP brigade could cap enough third rates to just keep a roller going. 
Uh, now I think the stronger guilds are going to have to be as good in crafting and trading in order to resource the building of their first, second and third rates as they are in fighting. And I suppose the good news is what it will probably mean is there'll be a lot more fleets that have connies and trinks and even frigates involved as the exhaustion of the top end ships uh, begins to take a toll on guilds who can perhaps only produce uh, a handful of first and second rates a week. Um, a good first rate can easily take three or four days effort and that's combined between a couple of players with getting the resources and, and getting the crafting hours up and then if you want to put some some mods on I mean some of the mods can cost you a thousand labor hours for a, a nicely crafted copper bottom or reinforced masts or reinforced rudder whatever it is you choose to have on your uh, on your ships and when you lose one of these durability one first classes or you've you've taken a couple of hits on a on a second class ship it's gone and so are all the upgrades so are all the modules so it's going to be interesting to see just in the next couple of weeks if clans and nations get exhausted especially fighting on multiple fronts uh, the brits have also expanded uh, a little bit here in South Haiti. They took three or four ports in South Haiti and this does give an interesting problem to the Danes unless the pirates help them out which is quite likely because they're part of a bit of an anti-Brit coalition um, in that they're going to have to maintain aggressive fleets now in in two fronts and you know this is a teleport uh, or it's an hour and a half sail uh, in fact longer than an hour and a half that's probably about a two hour sail uh, from here to here. So uh, the Brits are centered typically around here and around here. So for the Danes, they're going to have to have their big clans uh, working pretty hard to fight on two fronts. They do have some of the most dedicated clans. I know it's where a lot of the Russian players like to play and um, <coughs> some of their clans are extremely well organized and well craft supported. So very interesting uh, unfoldings in this neck of the woods. So the Spanish, obviously, they were going to come squeezing down here because, you know, what else would you do? Uh, but in actual fact, they kind of did not what was expected or not at least what was expected by me. Now, this could be because the Spanish are pretty tight with their pirate cousins. Um, and instead of pushing down into the Brits, they pushed into the Americans and they took a whole swatch of ports from the USA. They took all the islands around here. Uh, one of these was Brit, but the rest were American. And they pushed all the way down, um, down here into the Gulf and started pushing up this side too. And they took, you know, a good 10 ports around here. Uh, and, and that was very much while the USA uh, big biffing clans uh, were involved in recovering the retirement homes and the holiday resorts uh, around the Keys. So they gave the pirates a bit of a shellacking and pushed the pirates back quite hard. Now it will be interesting to see how this one plays out because this is kind of a natural defensive line. There's a bit of toing and froing goes on around here. If the Americans turn back to the Spanish, will that allow the pirates to push back in? Uh, as they did a couple of weeks ago where they almost pushed the Americans off the map on this uh, particular peninsula. Um, the pirates didn't have it as easy though. So typically they've been able to run around just capping people willy-nilly and not being worried about defence. Well, with the Americans pushing them down through the Keys, um, the Brits then pushed them in multiple directions. Um, they retook the islands around Cayman Brac and then they pushed into south central Cuba, uh, taking four or five ports, relatively unopposed, a few skirmishes going in and going out. And then the following night they backed that up with a few more ports around Cuba itself. It should be said that when the pirates defend in numbers, as they did here, um, they come with a really handy fleet and they've got a couple of really big clans uh, who are more than happy uh, to run some big ships out, some big first rates and second rates, well supported by third rates, well supported by screening fleets. 
and and these are handy sailors too they know what they're doing they know how to fight um, the Brits pretty much at the end of a I think a five or six capping run um, tried to snag uh, one of the main pirate ports Portobello I think it's called Portobello Portobello I can't remember right now I'm tired uh, but they tried to snag one of these just before shutdown on the, what would have been my Sunday night, probably most people's Saturday afternoons. And um, they met a very strong pirate defence. They, they even had a, a good screening fleet outside. And the British very bravely ran away. And I was in there, and that was good fun trying to get out of there. I got tagged two or three times in my constitution, which I'm loving sailing. Um, and I managed to get away, but a few times it was a two-on-one. I managed to run away bravely um, and, and get myself back to one of my bases. And perhaps the move of the week, nay indeed the move of the month, even though the pirates have probably lost the best part of 15 ports around here, um, was the audacious, nay unbelievable capping of Carlisle next to the British capital, which is kind of hilarious. Um, they turned up as the Brits were gangbanging along this coast here. Every day for the last week they have bought flags either against Carlisle or against Port Antonio and nothing's happened. Nothing's happened, it's just looked like a throwaway flag. And about an hour and a half before shutdown they bought a flag against Carlisle. Well Carlisle, every person coming out of the British national capital has to sail past Carlisle, it's just the way the harbour works. And they rocked up with a fantastic looking fleet full of first and seconds and backed up well by thirds and screeners. Um, and not only did they take Carlisle, which is just, you know, um, a major shock to the psyche of the British pubbies sailing around Jamaica, um, they also smashed some pretty big ships. I know that the, the in, in, in one battle, I think it was about a five on five, despite the fact, I don't even think the pirates had a first rate in there. I think they were in Connie's and Trinks and they managed to take a couple of Pavels and a, a Santee and perhaps a Vic, uh, somewhat compounded by the fact that the Santee player may have exploded near his mates. Um, and, and, and then after taking Carlisle, they've spent most of their time, as, as I think we all would, running around in basic cutters and just generally annoying everybody around um, um, Kingston, Port Royal. It's, it's incredibly annoying uh, and it's one of these funny things, it's like the worst strategic port to take in the world because you won't be able to defend it because the entire... Uh, British fleets can get in there. If you do defend it, you're going to keep taking losses. You're going to be exhausted. However, from a morale perspective, um, Britchat was an absolute mess after this fell. No one could understand how it could have been taken. Um, and, and it can be taken basically because the pirates sent a very well managed fleet full of pretty competent PVPers. And there was no clan defending it. So you can't expect folks just ambling by in their connies and trinks to go in there against Santis and Pavels and third rates. You, you're pretty much guaranteed to get smashed. So it does go to show if you turn up with a well-crafted fleet and a nice number of screeners, then um, you can do the do. Um, they planted the flag something like five seconds before the timer ran out. So, um, a real nail biter there, and that is the WTF moment of the month, or is it? Or is it? Because while all this was going on, while the Danes were smashing the Brits, while the Spanish were pumping into the Yanks, while the Yanks were giving the pirates a thrashing, and the Brits were stealing the southern Cuban and Haitian lowlands, um, you'll be glad to know that the European Consortium um, have now defined what is legally uh, referred to as a sausage as being a package of meat encased in a edible uh, skin. So, so that's good. That's a new ruling from the European Union. Uh, if you remember last week, uh, they've come up with a single currency and now they've defined the sausage. Uh, so well done. Well done everybody involved in that. We'll keep an eye on that for next week. Who knows? Who knows what could come out of that next week?
it's all action in this corner of the map. So let's see where we expect the action to be next week. Um, so the Spanish have gone nuts over here. They've gone nuts. They've almost doubled their holdings if you, if you, if you look at uh, Spanish ports. Um, the Americans have done fantastic pushing the pirates out. But now, what about over here? Um, I'm not sure if anything will kick off in this area because I suspect this will be this, pardon me, the stress point. Can the Brits defend these ports they've taken from the pirates? It is the pirates in the Spanish area that they're attacking and the pirates in the Spanish have really been working well together. Can the Danes, uh, all the pirates, uh, get rid of the Brit presence that's been established over here? Um, this is going to be really interesting. I have to say, I'm a, I, I'd really like to get involved in the Biffo in this area. My understanding is that the Russian-sounding Danes who are fighting in this area over here um, are extremely good sailors, uh, PVPers, and they have some really nice ships. Uh, I know there's a couple of good Brit clans around here, so I think this, if, if there's defended and contested ports in this area, I think some of the best PvP on the server will go around here. And then, of course, there is the big question. Will the Brits be able to mount a fleet capable of retaking Carlisle? Or will the pesky pirates be very naughty and go and grab up a couple of uh, other ports in this neck of the woods? And, and, and really, uh, if they could hold this for the week, or even just swap it, for one of the other ports, uh, Antonio perhaps, or Savannah Lamar, I think it will be a huge morale crush to the Brits and a huge morale victory to the Pirates. Um, there's really not been much going on in here. The Dutch have been pretty quiet. They snaffled up one port, I think. Uh, the French snaffled up a port. I've no idea how the French got a port. I didn't see any French flags go up. I think they've taken the Chinese model, and I think they've done some landfill and some land reclamation and created a new island that they're now claiming is theirs. Uh, we'll see what happens around there. So let's have a little look at the tally of Splinter's Sail and Blood. And um, probably the first time since I've been covering, uh, so the last month, the pirates have taken a shellacking, losing 13 ports. And that's really the Brits and the Americans working together as um, uh, was announced in the forums and broken on letter to the king. Uh, the Brits took losses now. If you have a look at the map, they took so many ports in the north. How could they have taken losses? Well, that was the damage the Danes did. The Danes did tremendous damage. And equally, the Americans, who, who really took a lot of ports back off the pirates, they too made a, a net loss. And that was very much due to the uh, work by the Spanish. Uh, you'll see the Danes here have made a huge gain in ports. Uh, the Dutch have taken a couple. Uh, I think they gave the poor old Spe Swedes another biffing. Uh, the Spanish, big gain for the Spanish, and that's very much to do with the fact that they went into the, the, the Gulf uh, uh, around the Yucatan and, and took a whole bunch of American ports. The French, as I said, they did some land reclamation, and, and that's how they've managed to get themselves a port. The poor old Swedes, uh, they peaked at 11, they're back down to 9. Um, so quite interesting that you've seen a real concertinering if you think about it two weeks ago uh, these guys were you know 20 30 ports ahead of, of the rest of the pack and now we're seeing the Danes and the Spanish uh, especially um, really cash in um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens next week it'll be interesting to see the impact of the patch with um, not being able to capture the AI warships anymore and people relying far more on the crafting capabilities of the clan. We'll have to see how, how that all sort of boils out. It was a great week of PvP. I don't think I've seen the map change so much since I've been on the server, uh, on this particular server. Not a long time, I guess, four weeks, but it's, it, it, it just went bazookas. Uh, great fun again some really good PvP um, it's good to see that really all the nations are fielding big sort of planned uh, well organized nicely crafted ships uh, the rumor is the Danes were running around with a 25 fleet shallow port golden fleet a dread fleet for the shallow ports as it were and uh, that's something that clans should really aim to do is get themselves a shallow water 
fleet and a deep water fleet and and then really work hard on getting your crafting up anyway that's it for this week's letter to the king um, I do try and sort of get the nub of what's happened right. Sometimes the stories perhaps about how ports fell are told through rose-tinted eyes from one side or the other. It's difficult to uh, get facts. It's war after all. It happens in a fog. Uh, so I am trying to do uh, as good a job as I can reporting the to-in and fro-in, um, but I can't really check my uh, sources particularly well. Uh, so I'm probably, I, I, I position myself as probably better than Fox News, but not quite the BBC yet. Uh, anyway, uh, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this week's letter uh, for the King. Um, I'm definitely going to do one next week because it's getting pretty fascinating right now on uh, Euro PvP 1. If you did enjoy it, hit like, give me a subscribe. And you'll be able to keep in touch with the ebb and flow of the Biff on Euro PvP 1. So I will see you on the ocean and I will catch you.